On behalf of the Carolina Asia Center, please allow me to welcome all of you to tonight's event. My name is Christian Cunningham Lentz. I'm serving as the interim director for the Carolina Asia Center. Um, let me just say that the Carolina Asia Center is the flagship Asia Institute of the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill and the leading center of its kind in the southeastern United States. Our mission is to promote intercultural exchange between the US and Asia and to support education and research on Asia. Okay. So my words are very brief right now, limited to a few thank yous, an overview of our event, and a brief introduction to our introducer. Okay. So first and foremost, let me thank my colleague Ji Yoon Jo for leading the Carolina Asia Center, into whose big shoes I am stepping for this semester. I also want to thank Professor Morgan Patelka for leading the Carolina Asia Center before Ji Yoon Jo, um, and Morgan also for inviting our guest tonight. I want to thank our excellent Carolina Asia Center staff, particularly Catherine Ulrich and Shui Lin for organizing this event. And finally, I want to thank all of you for coming out on a cool winter night. Okay. So the overview. In a moment, my colleague Michelle King, an esteemed cultural historian of 19th and 20th century China, will introduce our speaker. The speaker will deliver her lecture, followed by an interview with, with uh, Professor King at the front of the room. Okay. And then finally, the speaker will field questions from the audience. If you'd like to pose a question, please avail yourself of one of the two microphones on either side of the auditorium. Um, in short, please hold your questions until the end. Okay? With that, I now invite my colleague, Professor King, to introduce our speaker, Dr. Leita Form Hong Fincher. Um, it's my great pleasure to introduce to you Dr. Leita Holm Fincher tonight. Um, Dr. Fincher and I first met quite a few years ago in Beijing when we were studying and working and kind of establishing ourselves as young indigenous, which is really nice to catch up with her over lunch today. Um, Dr. Fincher got her BA from Harvard and her MA from Stanford in East Asian Studies after which she worked for many years as a journalist um, in Asia for Voice of America, CNBC Asia, Radio Free Asia, and all, uh, a number of media outlets. She then kind of took a turn and returned to academia by getting her PhD at Tsinghua University in sociology. She was the first American to receive her PhD um, from Tsinghua in sociology, and uh, it's given her a lot of particular insights into contemporary Chinese gender issues. Um, but her first book, Leftover Women, The Resurgence of Gender Inequality in China, came out in 2014 that was based on her dissertation research. And it was uh, named one of the best books on China by the New York Times in 2018, one of the top five China books of 2014 by the Asia Society, and one of the best foreign policy books by the Foreign Policy Interrupted. So if you're looking for a good read, that's a good choice. Um, her second book, the one that she's going to be talking about tonight, is called Betraying Big Brother, The Feminist Awakening in China. Um, this book has also been widely reviewed and positively reviewed and named one of the best books of 2018 by Vanity Fair, Newsweek, and Foreign Policy Interrupted. Most recently, she has served as adjunct assistant professor at Columbia, and it is my great pleasure and honor to please join me in welcoming her here to UNC. Um, thank you, let me just attach it. <laughs> thank you so much to the Carolina Asia Center for inviting me here um, to beautiful North Carolina, although I must admit that um, I was expecting somewhat warmer weather. <laughs> this is just, I've been living in New York now and it's exactly the same temperature, so. Um, but thank you all for coming out on a rather chilly night. Um, I thought that I would begin with a brief reading from my book, and then I'll go into the lecture. I'm going to explain to you um, all of the dynamics that I think are really interesting about China's feminist movement. When Chinese authorities arrested feminist activist Wei Tingting in Beijing on March 6, 
2015, just before International Women's Day. They confiscated her glasses so she could no longer see. Severely visually impaired, Wei was only able to tell people apart by their voices. State security agents took away her cell phone and laptop and demanded her passwords. They led her to a dimly lit underground area of a police station, took her warm snow boots, and put her in a small unheated room about five square meters wide, as the temperature outside fell to below freezing. Then the interrogations began. Why are you engaged in subversive activities about sexual harassment? Who is collaborating with you in your women's rights activism? Which foreign agencies are funding your actions? Wei told the blurry figures in front of her that she wanted to call a lawyer before answering any questions. You can't call a lawyer now, don't you get it? Don't you understand the law? Wei made it through one round of interrogations and thought it would be over. But in the middle of the night, she had no idea what time it was because she had no watch. The agents took her out for another interrogation. This time, someone videotaped her as she spoke. Even when she went to the toilet, a female agent observed her. For the first time in her life, Wei Tingting, just 26 years old at the time of her detention, began to think about escaping abroad. She felt disoriented and overwhelmed by a mounting sense of powerlessness. Then she heard some indistinct murmurs seeping through from outside and put her ear up against the wall of her cell to listen more closely. With astonishment, she recognized the voice of one of her feminist sisters, Wang Man, who had taken part in some activist campaigns with her. My God, Wang Man is in here too, she thought. Wei yelled out to a guard that she was thirsty and needed a drink of water, then put her ear up against the wall to listen again. She made out the voices of other feminist activists who had been arrested along with her. Besides Wang Man, she could hear Li Maizu, Li's girlfriend, Teresa Xu, and several other university students who had volunteered for feminist campaigns in the past. Wei later described how she overcame her feeling of helplessness in an online essay, later deleted, she called Prison Notes, which she posted on WeChat under a pseudonym. I decided I must resist this feeling of sorrow and take action, so I started to do a lot of different things. My room was freezing and I was only allowed to wear slippers, so I began doing leg exercises such as kicks and squats. Then I did deep meditation exercises. Other people before me had scratched words onto the old walls, so I squinted my eyes up close to the walls to examine them. Then I spun around in circles singing songs, she wrote. Wei sang out loud, both to cheer herself up and to let the other detained women hear her voice and know that they were not alone, that she too was in there with them. Li Maizu also sang back a song for all women, the anthem of China's feminist movement. Protect my rights, don't keep me down, why must I keep, lose my freedom? Let's break free from our heavy shackles and reclaim our power as women. Her spirits buoyed, Wei Tingting writes, she recovered her sense of defiance. Even as I heard two guards walking back and forth making clanking noises outside, I felt a kind of joy in betraying Big Brother. So that's where the title of the book comes from. And um, let me just turn this on. And um, here's a picture of the five women who were jailed. Um, Wei Tingting, whose uh, essay we just heard from is the bottom center there. So all of these women, with the exception of Lee Mai's on the upper, upper left-hand side, um, needed to wear glasses. And one of the first things that security agents did when they were arrested was to remove their glasses to disorient them. And Wei Tingting was uh, really virtually blind um, without her glasses. Um, the reason why these women were arrested and thrown into jail or detention in 2015 is because they were planning, they were part of a larger group of feminist activists who were planning to commemorate International Women's Day on 2015 
um, the just before March 8, 2015. Um, they were planning to hand out stickers about sexual harassment on subways and buses. But even before they carried out this activity, Chinese police in several different cities across China rounded up these feminist activists and uh, prevented them from carrying out this activity. Um, they ended up, after one day, focusing on these five women who actually lived in three different cities, Beijing, Hangzhou, and Guangzhou, and brought all of them, all of them to the same detention center in Beijing. Um, now, in arresting and jailing these women, the Chinese authorities clearly thought that they would be able to prevent the development of some kind of large-scale feminist movement. But in fact, the actual reverse happened because prior to their arrest, uh, these women were basically anonymous. Nobody knew about them. And they were part of a group of, I would say, about, oh, yeah, about 100 feminist activists who were regularly planning activities that they called performance art to raise awareness about gender inequality in China. So here are a couple of examples of the kinds of activities that these women were involved in. And they got very active, particularly in 2012. Um, so one of the activities that they did was um, they called Shou Shang Pinyang, Bloody Brides, where these three young women, uh, one of them is Wei Ping Ping, um, wore these white wedding gowns, paraded down a main street in Beijing, um, and the wedding gowns are kind of stained with faux red blood to call attention to the epidemic of domestic violence in China. And at that time, there was no nationwide anti-domestic violence law. Um, notably, in 2016, the Chinese government actually passed an anti-domestic violence law, which was a legal milestone. Um, but at that time, there was no law. Um, so that was one of their activities. But it, you know they're very simple. It was only three women involved. This was another below. Is another activity that they organized in the southern city of Guangzhou, which they called Occupy Men's Toilets. And uh, the, these activists deliberately chose actions that they thought would not be considered politically sensitive, um, so that they could avoid getting into trouble. So. They chose the issue of insufficient toilets for women uh, because they thought that was something that everybody could really identify with. You know, there are always these long lines for the women's bathroom, and that's pretty common here in the US as well. So these activists took over a public toilet in Guangzhou and asked the men to leave the stalls, and they invited women in to use the vacated men's stall. And then they also held up some signs saying, you know, women need more public toilets. So it was kind of funny as well, and that's on another hallmark of their, their, a lot of their activities have an element of humor to them. Um, so these were the kinds of actions that they were engaged in um, in the years leading up to the jailing of these five women in 2013. And by the way, the Occupy Men's Toilets action received very favorable coverage from the Chinese state media, including Xinhua News. So uh, prior to that 2015, the government never considered these women to be any threat at all. I mean, sometimes they would be called in for some routine questioning and then let go. There was no real crackdown on their activities. So it was an enormous shock to everybody, to first of all, to the feminist community inside China, um, to human rights activists, to scholars inside China, um, but also outside China. When these five women were jailed for basically doing nothing, they hadn't even actually handed out these stickers about sexual harassment. They were just talking about doing it. And they were talking about doing it to celebrate International Women's Day, which is actually a holiday commemorated in China, and women get the day off. So it's a really big deal in China 
unlike here in the US. Um, overnight, the supporters of these bi feminists came up with the term feminist bi, or new chin, new DMA. And that, that just caught on, um, and so the women became very quickly famous. There was a lot of international media attention. Um, there were protests held around the world calling for the release of the feminist spy. As you can see, uh, there was a tweet at the time from then uh, front runner for US president, Hillary Clinton, who tweeted um, saying that he, Xi Jinping is hosting a meeting on women's rights at the UN while persecuting feminists, shameless. So what Hillary Clinton was referring to was the fact that the Chinese government was persecuting these feminist activists just before China was about to co-host the 20th anniversary commemoration of the Beijing World Conference on uh, Women that was held in 1995. Um, and Xi Jinping was the co-host at this big women's rights conference held at the United Nations in, in New York. Uh, well, at the same time, in an act of blatant hypocrisy, the government was jailing these five young women um, for really just wanting to hand out stickers about sexual harassment. Um, so inside China, there was a campaign um, among the supporters of these feminist activists to post uh, a picture on Weibo, which is China's equivalent of Twitter, every day, marking each day that the feminists were in detention. And here are just a couple of <coughs> pictures. The first one, the first day up above, um, shows these five women wearing the masks uh, with photographs of the five, the feminist five, and they're posing they're in this kind of picture reminiscent of the Beatles' Abbey Road album cover, crossing the street, um, calling for the re release of these women. But they were, the pictures were all very playful. And this was a, you know, another characteristic of all of the feminist campaigns, that they, they had this playful kind of humor, um, comedic angle, um, making fun of what was really a very dire situation. That each day they would post pictures of these five women wearing the masks of the feminist five, posing in kind of humorous situations out in public, outside, enjoying freedom of movement, enjoying life as though they were free, while the five women were actually uh, held in jail, completely incommunicado completely unaware of, of what was going on outside. Um, this is another example. The, the uh, picture below is on the 31st day of the detention of the feminist activists. And the women here wearing the masks of the feminist five are posing in front of um, a public toilet. So that's reminiscent of that Occupy Men's Toilets action that they organized <coughs> in 2012. Um, so there was a social media campaign to try to raise awareness about these feminists. But of course, because of very heavy internet censorship in China, um, these pictures were quickly deleted. But within the feminist and human rights community, they were still being widely circulated. And meanwhile, there was a lot of pressure through international news media um, and political figures calling for the release of these women. And in fact, the women were released. Um, actually, let me get to that in a second. The women were released after 37 days in detention. And what is really remarkable is not so much that they were jailed, but the fact that they were released so quickly because the Chinese authorities in recent years have become much more repressive and intolerant of any kind of social movement or, or anything that may have the potential to become a, a large social movement. Um, so it was really striking that after 37 days, the women were released from detention. 
So um, what I'd like to do is give you a bigger context. Um, because underlying uh, this whole uh, incident with the Feminist Five and the jailing of these five young women in 2015 is um, a background with uh, of gender, accelerating gender inequality, um, increasing authoritarian repression, but it's something that's uh, part of what I call patriarchal authoritarianism. So the increasing um, authoritarian repression, particularly under Chinese President Xi Jinping, has patriarchy and misogyny, the oppression of women at its very core in many different ways. And so it's in that context that these feminist activists were perceived by the government to be such a threat. Um, because you could say, well, you know, they weren't really planning to do anything. They just wanted to hand out stickers. Why jail them? Um, but it's really what these women represented that was such a threat. So just to give you a little bit of background about <coughs> Xi Jinping, who recently uh, uh, basically abolished term limits for his position. Prior to um, his ascendancy as general secretary of the Communist Party, there was a consensus that the Chinese president should only rule for 10 years. And so um, for quite a few uh, of his predecessors, they were in power for 10 years. Um, and so that was the understanding that the president would step down after 10 years, but he just got rid of that. And so theoretically, at any rate, he could be China's ruler for life. And he's developed a personality cult around him. A lot of people have written about this rather unprecedented personality cult, the likes of which we haven't really seen since the era of Chairman Mao, the founder of the People's Republic. Um, but in addition to being a personality cult, that cult is very hyper-masculine. So um, one of the things I'm highlighting here is um, the notion of Jia Guo Tian Xia, or family state under heaven. Um, this was a concept that was introduced um, in two, 2017, and uh, it basically conveys the idea of Xi Jinping as this very paternalistic patriarch overseeing um, all these millions of male headed patriarchal families where everybody plays a certain role according to their gender, where the, the man is the head of the family, the woman is supposed to be the obedient wife and mother, um, and that constitutes a, uh, a harmonious family. Um, so this was a very interesting long article in Xinhua News in 2017 where they talked about this notion of family values. And what was particularly interesting to me was um, it said, the article said, C stresses the importance of family values. He says, little family, xiao jia, but he has in mind the big family, guo jia. Now, guo jia is the word for, for the country. But if you break it down into its compound words, guo means country, and xia means family. And so they actually break it down and say that guo jia is the big family. And they go on about how China is one big family. And everybody, if every family, every little family in China is harmonious and everybody plays their proper role according to their gender, um, and that way, the entire nation, uh, the big family, will be basically stable. So what's striking to me is that how, uh, uh, how this propaganda that is kind of propagated through all sorts of media, the CCTV, state television, um, in fact, these are screenshots from state television 
sort of depicting this idea and showing Xi Jinping, um, especially the lower picture, that's Xi Jinping there with his elderly mother, he's holding her hand and playing the very filial, filial dutiful son, um, and above he's you know, being the father to his daughter. Um, but it's really striking how similar this Communist Party propaganda is to centuries old Confucian didactic texts about womanly virtue and the importance of family. So if you just take as a comparison, this text from the Qing Dynasty, these biographies of exemplary women, which I'll read, um, the daughter obeys her parents, the daughter-in-law reverently serves her parents-in-law, the wife assists her husband, the mother guides her sons and daughters. When every family is harmonious, the state is well governed. And it's very striking that today um, the propaganda is uh, in bringing back a lot of these old Confucian ideas about family, about hierarchical roles that everybody should be playing, or the, the woman is subservient. Um, and, and there's a lot of uh, emphasis on Confucianism today, which is quite notable given that Confucianism was really attacked for quite a few decades in the early part of um, the communist era. So, uh, and a little bit more background about this hyper-masculine personality cult surrounding Xi Jinping. Um, in the early years of his, I call it reign, I mean, uh, there, there were a lot of hip-hop songs that were created. So it, it permeated pop culture. Um, one of the songs was, if you want to marry, marry someone like Xi Dada which is kind of like Big Daddy's scene. Um, and it was this you know, really hip-hop beat um, containing images of really macho pictures of Xi Jinping. That's a screenshot of him where he's in this now suit standing up in a car surveilling the People's Liberation Army troops at Tiananmen Square, um, showing him to be you know, very much this strong man in charge of the nation, very masculine. And also notable is that in Xi Jinping's first major speech as General Secretary of the Communist Party in January of 2013, he talked at length about why it was that communism collapsed in Eastern Europe and in the Soviet Union. And this line really stands out to me. The Soviet Communist Party had more members than we do, but nobody was man enough to stand up and resist. So he then criticizes Gorbachev for being too weak. So the implication is that Xi Jinping is the man. He's man enough to stand up and resist and fight against the uh, perceived hostile foreign forces, um, aka the US mainly, trying to interfere in China's internal affairs and trying to undermine the Communist Party. So uh, there's a lot of propaganda that I talk about. In fact, I'll give you some examples um, where they push really traditional gender norms and uh, there's no mention at all in this propaganda of the importance of working women to China's economy, which is really striking given that China's entered a new period of slowing economic growth and female labor force participation is really plummeting. And so if China really wants to jumpstart economic growth again, it, what it should be doing is actually encouraging uh, the promotion of women, working women, and we're trying to remove obstacles to women's advancing in the workforce. But it's not, the propaganda is actually doing the opposite. So here's an example. Um, at the end of 2015, the Chinese government made a huge policy reversal. Um, it ended the decades-long so-called one-child policy. 
And that was a very draconian form of population planning, where there were all, all sorts of egregious abuses, like um, uh, female infanticide, forced abortion, um, forced insertion of IUDs, that kind of thing that would be widely documented. Um, but at the end of 2015, the government said, we're getting rid of that. And from now on, we're going to have a two-child policy. Um, so it was widely lauded as something really great for China that would result in a baby boom. And at the very moment they, they announced it, they also started this propaganda campaign, really pushing particularly educated Han Chinese women who have gone to college or are still in college to have to get married and have babies. And so this is the actual picture that they use on one of these people's daily, very long people's daily piece, where the mother figure, to me, is reminiscent of um, Margaret Atwood's dystopian novel, A Handmaid's Tale, where you, know, you can't even see the woman's face because basically that's irrelevant because the woman is just a biological vessel for the delivery of the colorful baby in her arms. Um, but what is notable is that the, the mother figure there has a mortarboard on her head indicating that she graduated from university. And it is striking how much of this pro-natalist propaganda is aimed at university women. Um, here's some more examples. This is from 2017, People's Daily Online. And the headline is, you better believe it, under 30 are women's best years for getting pregnant. And if you look at these pictures, they're of new graduates who are all very, you know, made up and conventionally extremely pretty. And they're, you know, gathered around the baby carriage because that's their next goal is to have the baby. And on the right is this you know, very happy, um, attractive woman who not only does she already have a toddler, but she is visibly pregnant with her second baby. And so that's a presentation of, you know, the a very rosy picture of what awaits you as a female university graduate. Um, just go on and hurry up and marry and have your babies and you two can be very happy as these women are. Um, and in this article, they actually have the, the subheading um, that is encouraging college students to have babies. Female, yeah, this is a direct quote, female university students joyful love. Freshman year live together, sophomore year get pregnant, junior year have baby, which uh, is not happening. Um, so this is the propaganda drive that's been going on for the last few years, and it's all targeted at university educated Han Chinese women. Why? Because the birth rates, especially among that cohort of women, birth rates are falling. And in fact, the Chinese government just released new statistics showing that births in China last year fell to a historic low that was lower even than during uh, the Great Leap Forward famine of 1961. So I believe the births, total births were something like 14.5 million. So the government had hoped that this new two-child policy would result in a baby boom, um, but that has not happened. In fact, it's the absolute reverse. The births keep falling. Um, so what else are they doing? Um, here's another example of the kinds of just very traditional gender norms, the kind of femininity that they're pushing. Um, this picture here is from a school that was opened by the All China Women's Federation, which is the state agency that is supposed to be promoting the rights of, and interests of women. But in actual fact, it just is really 
pushing the same kinds of very subservient roles for women. Um, and so there was this school that was opened in uh, 2018, and it was called uh, New Era Women uh, Courses. New Era being one of the catchphrases for the Xi Jinping New Era of China, and what are women <coughs> supposed to be like in this Xi Jinping's New Era? Well, they're supposed to learn how to apply makeup properly and sit correctly and with their legs properly crossed. Um, and there's the instructor showing you know, the student how to cross their legs correctly. Um, and the article here said that these courses were designed to raise the quality of these women. He calls is this notion that um, kind of vague, but that the population, you know, there are some people who can in inherently are just of higher quality than other people. Um, so, and, and I just want to read uh, a little bit of an excerpt of this column. Um, it, it's actually from 2011, but I just think that it's very telling. Um, and by the way, I found this column. It was uh, published by Xinhua News, but it was on the website of the All China Women's Federation. Um, it says, pretty girls don't need a lot of education to marry into a rich and powerful family, but girls with an average or ugly appearance will find it difficult. These kinds of girls hope to further their education in order to increase their competitiveness. The tragedy is they don't realize that as women age, they're worth less and less. So by the time they get their MA or PhD, they are already old, like yellowed pearls. So you see a lot of this kind of language um, that is really trying to convince women not to pursue advanced degrees. It's one thing, at the moment I haven't seen anything yet saying that women shouldn't be going to college, thank goodness. But, uh, but from the government's perspective, as soon as women graduate from college, they should just hurry up and marry and have their two babies. Um, and in fact, well, just before I go on to the next slide. In fact, uh, women today are better at educated than ever before in Chinese history. And you would think that that would be something that the Chinese government would really want to celebrate. But it's the opposite again. The government sees this as a crisis for the nation, as a problem, because when women become more educated um, and delay marriage and childbirth, that means that um, the, birth, the women that the government most wants to be having children, these women who are considered gao suzhi, or high quality, the women who go to university in the first place, those are the women who really no longer want to have that many children. Um, and marriage rates have also been falling year by year. So uh, there's a fall in marriage rates, a real plummeting in births, and this is part of a really impending demographic crisis for, for the Chinese government because when births fall, that exacerbates the overall aging of the population and leads to the shrinking of the workforce, which is going to, in a couple of decades, lead to a lot of problems for labor productivity and for the Chinese economy, unless it starts uh, you know, importing a lot of workers from other places. So, I want to point out that uh, that the population planning policy of the Chinese government is not simply about how to control the quantity of births. So in the past, over the decades, um, during which the one child policy uh, were enforced, they were trying to limit the quantity of the population, but at the same time, another very important part of population planning policy is controlling or upgrading 
so to speak, upgrading population quality. Um, because there's this strong strain of eugenics in population planning through, uh, throughout the last few decades, actually. Um, and I write about this quite a bit more in my first book, Leftover Women, if you're interested in reading that. Um, but in an indication, just an example of how the Chinese government treats people who are considered to be of low quality. So people who are seen as problems, you can look at the policies being carried out in Xinjiang in northwestern China. Um, you probably have heard about the news about mass detention camps in China where there are, in Xinjiang, where there are roughly one million uh, largely Uyghur, Kazakh, Muslim, uh, or Kyrgyz Muslim people who are being held in these detention camps. Um, now there are, even prior to the construction of these camps, there was, a, there was quite a bit of rhetoric already being published in Chinese state media about how it was a problem that there was rapid population growth in Xinjiang. So while nationwide, the rhetoric from the government is about how it's a real problem that China's births are falling and that our population growth is too slow, it's slowing. It's, again, the complete opposite in Xinjiang so if you go back to 2015, there's this example of a senior Xinjiang official who says high birth rates in southern Xinjiang, quote, negatively affects population quality in the region, posing risks to social stability. So why would that be considered a risk to social stability if actually nationwide, you know, falling births are considered a risk to social stability? It all depends on what kind of people you're talking about. Um, and in 2017, uh, the Global Times said that there were worryingly high birth rates, rapid population growth in Xinjiang. And in, in 2017, in July, Xinjiang actually reversed. So at the end of 2015, there was a lot of news about how China um, got rid of the one-child policy, but there was also a major change in population planning policy in Xinjiang in July 2017. Prior to that point, for decades, ethnic minorities were allowed to have one child more than Han Chinese, the majority Han Chinese. And this was part of their overall strategy of promoting ethnic harmony, um, but they changed that, and in July 2017, they said everybody, all ethnic minorities, also have to have only two children. So for, for Han Chinese, the two-child policy is an increased permissiveness, where married urban couples are now, they used to be allowed one child, and now they're encouraged have two children, for ethnic minorities in Xinjiang, it's actually a drastic change where the number of babies they're allowed to have is actually being cut. Um, and there, just very recently, there have been a lot of worrying accounts from women who've escaped from Xinjiang talking about forced sterilization. So it, it's a very, very worrying situation. And it does show you that um, the Chinese government, in spite of you know, all of its talk about um, being more permissive about uh, women's reproductive rights, it's actually still very strictly engineering, trying to engineer the population. So how does this relate to the feminist movement? Well, the fact is that because women are seen as so central in China as basically reproductive agents of the state. That's, uh, they're not seen um, as promising you know, participants in the workforce. 
That's not what we're seeing at all. We're seeing actually an increase in gender discrimination in hiring, where women are routinely asked by uh, employers, have you had your first baby? Uh, have you had your second baby? When are you going to have your baby? And so a lot of, uh, even though it's actually technically illegal in China, employers are also uh, advertising, blatantly advertising that they're only looking for men in their hiring. Um, so for all sorts of reasons, which I go into a lot in my book, um, the feminists are presenting a completely different message. So what they are saying, and this goes to the heart of why the feminist message is considered to be so subversive in China, is because these feminist activists are telling young women all across China, you should be able to make your own choices about your life. You shouldn't have to marry if you don't want to. You shouldn't have to have babies if you don't want to. And that's a big part of their message. And another major issue is also sexual violence, tackling the epidemic of sexual violence. So the Me Too movement has caught on in a really big way in China. And you wouldn't necessarily, you haven't heard a lot about it necessarily. The only reason why you haven't heard a lot about it is because of massive internet censorship and the fact that there's no freedom of the press in China. Um, but in fact, there was a Hong Kong University study in 2018 of the top 10 most censored topics on WeChat. WeChat is this uh, telephone messaging app that is used by hundreds of millions of Chinese. And Me Too, topics related to Me Too actually made it into the top 10 most censored topics in 2018, which is really remarkable given all of the other politically sensitive topics that are censored in China. For example, you know, the Tiananmen Massacre, Tibetan independence, Xinjiang independence, Taiwan independence, um, all of these other topics that are, have long been considered completely off limits. Um, and yet, Me Too, this new phenomenon that just started to catch on in China, um, where individual women were, were just popping up all over the country on their own and starting to tell their story about how they had been sexually harassed or abused by so-and-so person. Um, there have been, there, there's been some news coverage of it actually. Um, it, because it's so widespread that even the Chinese state media can't completely ignore its existence. Um, so, I'd like to kind of conclude, uh, well, actually one more thing that is important is that in 2017, the People's Daily actually directly said that wet, quote unquote, Western feminism was a threat. And this was something that was new. It was a threat um, because Western hostile forces, like the U.S., were using feminism to interfere in China's handling of its affairs, of women's affairs. Um, so I believe after all these years, just ob observing, I mean, just from my, um, my first book when I was talking about the resurgence of gender inequality in general in China through the jailing of the feminist five in 2015, and in the years since then, it's been almost five years since those five women were jailed. And when I actually finished writing my book, I finished the actual writing, and I had to keep updating it in 2018 because so much was happening with Me, Me Too movements on campuses. All across China, there were all these students um, at dozens of universities signing petitions, demanding that their universities take sexual harassment and sexual misconduct 
uh, on campus seriously. Um, so there was a flurry of activity, and I actually had to stop writing in June 2018. And at the time that I finished the book, I wasn't quite sure. I thought, how do I, I don't know about the future of this feminist movement. It's definitely been very dynamic and resilient. These activists are really incredible. They're very inspiring. But because um, the state security apparatus is so brutal and repressive, you know, maybe they're just going to jail everybody. And maybe that'll be an end to it. But here we are, five years after the jailing of the feminist five, and this movement is still going on. It's really uh, incredible to me that the momentum of the women's rights movement has been sustained in spite of all sorts of obstacles, um, not just in the individual persecution of activists, but widespread internet censorship. There was uh, this picture on the upper right there, these carnival-like uh, women. They're all wearing masks. They're kind of like, uh, I'm sure they're inspired by Chrissy Riot in Russia. They look like they're celebrating. But actually, they were doing this. They were actually doing a mock burial for New Chien which is Feminist Voices which was the most influential platform for feminist ideas on Weibo and WeChat. And then the government banned it in 2018, uh, right after International Women's Day. So these women were feminist activists in southern China. Oh, it's hard to see because of those lights, but there's a banner up there that you really can't see it in the light. But it says, which means feminism will not die. And they're, so they turned this mock burial into a carnival-like celebration because they are saying, you know, you can do whatever you want to try to kill us off, but feminism will not die. And that I find to be really inspiring. And, and I think that all, so many of these young women that I interviewed for my book, these feminist activists, are incredibly inspiring.